Thank you. So today I would like to talk about adult medulloblastoma treatment. We know that adult medulloblastoma is rare, but it is common enough that many large centers will meet patients, a couple of patients every year, because this is a very aggressive, rapidly growing uh, <clears throat> tumor. It is important uh, that these centers are ready to treat the patients uh, immediately. Uh, you because you know very few patients are uh, uh, treated at one center. It is very challenging to find an expert in the field. So literature review helps, and hopefully my presentation will help to better better understand uh, the complexity of uh, medulloblastoma uh, treatment in adult patients. Uh, usually, uh, a little bit uh, more uh, males are affected than uh, than females. Uh, majority of the patients are white. The average age of diagnosis is around 30, 31 uh, year old. Usually patients uh, present with progressive reversing symptoms. The symptoms are getting worse over weeks, maybe even sometimes months. They complain about headache, maybe nausea, vomiting, some balance issues, uh, problems with coordination, dizziness, maybe change with hearing, vision change, double vision. Um, and on physical exam, we can find signs of intracranial pressure, increased intracranial pressure, maybe some cranial nerve deficit. Mm -hmm. We might see uh, gait uh, problems, uh, imbalance, uh, head uh, titubation, nystagmus. Um, so all of the signs are basically pointing towards the posterior fossa. It is important that we do a good general examination of the patient, do a thorough neurological evaluation, including fundoscopy. Um, and hopefully we will do a good skin exam and get a good family history from the patients. If we don't do that before we get the diagnosis of uh, medulloblastoma, definitely I would recommend to go back and do uh, uh, be uh, through diligence about skin exam and family history. These are important because about 5% um, of medulloblastoma patients uh, present as part of a, a syndrome, a genetic syndrome, Gerdlin, Lifromenae, uh, Turcot, or other syndromes. So identifying these genetic families, genetic syndromes, uh, will affect how we approach the patient and what other services are providing to the patient. Usually when patients are present with the symptoms I just described, they will be sent down to radiology. They get a CT head, maybe with contrast, which shows a hyperdense mass. Uh, there will be enhancement of the lesion. MRI brain will need to be done and we will see ISO or hypo-intense uh, lesion on T1, which is heterogeneously enhancing. Uh, on T2, we see hyperintense lesion. And ADC is an important marker that might help us in differential diagnosis. Because of the, of the location, ependymoma might be part of the uh, differential diagnosis, but ADC is hyperintense in ependymoma and medulloblastoma usually hypointense. Of course, uh, this is just per textbook and uh, life can uh, bring us surprises, but this is a kind of uh, a, a guide that we can uh, use. We might see necrosis, hemorrhage, cystic changes, and definitely these patients need to put, and we always need to think of hydrocephalus. When we identify medulloblastoma, it is very important to image the entire CNS axis. These tumors tend to metastatize, uh, so we need to have a brain and entire spine imaging done. We can do imaging either before surgery or we can do it like two weeks after surgery just to make sure that the surgery artifact uh, does not uh, interfere with our uh, quality of imaging and with the, the decision. Also, these patients need to have a, a lumbar puncture. CSF analysis needs to be done, again, even before uh, surgery, or if we did not have a chance to do that before surgery, we need to wait two to three weeks and do uh, an LP, just to make sure that, again, the surgical uh, artifact remaining factors do not affect our uh, assessment. 
So this is an MRI patient, uh, MRI uh, picture of my patient who was diagnosed with wind activated medulloblastoma. Uh, as you can see, we have the hypo intense large lesion um, uh, and contrast enhancement. Uh, we have hyper intense signal in uh, T2 flare, and you can see some signs of hemorrhage. If you take a look at this image, it uh, you will see how uh, the fourth ventricle is pushed. So again, hydrocephalus watch is important. Also, if you take a look at this image, this corner, the intensity of contrast enhancement might give us a clue. It is thought that wind activated uh, medulloblastoma has porous uh, vessels and there, um, contrast enhancement is just really, really bright. Uh, the other thing uh, that MRI helps us is the location of the lesion. This is a wind activated tumor, and this is a typical location of wind activated tumor in the dorsal um, uh, uh, brainstem um, area. For SHH activated tumors, they are located more laterally in the cerebellar hemispheres. So pathology, we will see, uh, you know, small cells. Uh, these are uh, highly malignant embryonal neuroepithelial tumors. All medulloblastoma, by definition, WH grade four, uh, because of the aggressive biological uh, behavior we learned. Uh, the we distinguish histological and molecular subtypes, and we will talk uh, more about that. We need to remember when we talk about uh, medulloblastoma that adult medulloblastoma is different from pediatric medulloblastoma. And what we learned about pediatric medulloblastoma does not necessarily uh, can be extrapolated to adult medulloblastoma. It's like um, you know, uh, children are not small adults. Adult medulloblastoma is not equal uh, to, to pediatric medulloblastoma. In terms of histological subtypes, we distinguish four. We have the classic um, histological subtype, desmoplastic nodular, uh, desmoplastic with ex extensive nodularity and large cell anaplastic. Sometimes this information can give uh, give us clue about a prognosis. There are uh, better prognostic uh, signs like desmoplastic is usually considered better and definitely large cell anaplastic probably harbor a more aggressive behavior. We also distinguish uh, four molecular subtypes and this is like a changing field in neuro-oncology. As we are learning with all other uh, brain tumors and CNS tumors, molecular subtypes are gaining more uh, presence in the diagnosis and in the treatment of uh, brain tumors. In adults, the most common subtype is the SHH, sonic hedgehog uh, activated um, subtype with white type P P53. Then we have uh, the non SHH and the non-wind group, uh, then uh, the uh, wind activated is present about uh, 15%. Very rare to see P53 mutant SHH in adults. And basically within this group, the non-SHH, non-wind, we have group three and four. Group, uh, group three is almost unheard of. Very, very few patients have group three um, in uh, adulthood. Uh, some histology subtypes present more frequently with these molecular subtypes. And there is a very interesting immune phenotype uh, difference between these subtypes. Uh, I highlighted those that are kind of specific for one subtype, like nuclear uh, beta catenin is specific for wind. Um, the YAP1, GAP1 negative um, uh, phenotype is specific for, uh, for the uh, non-SHH, non-WIND. There are genetic mutations that are frequently seen, so good, for look, uh, good to look for them. 
In terms of prognosis, again, we learned and have more data about uh, children, adult uh, pediatric medulloblastoma that does not necessarily true for adult. For example, wind activated medulloblastoma uh, harbors good prognosis in children. It is good prognosis in adult too, but not as good as with children. And we need to take this seriously. Other uh, thing I would like to mention is that molecular profiling is available and it is recommended to get it done for uh, every patient with medulloblastoma. Uh, risk stratification will be important in the treatment of medulloblastoma because that's how we will determine what type of treatment is needed for the patient. Uh, we have the traditional modified uh, Chang uh, uh, staging criteria, then the PECR, and we also have guidelines from NCCN. The Chang criteria is still relevant. Uh, basically, important thing to know is that M0 uh, harbors no evidence uh, of uh, any metastasis, not on imaging, not on CSF, and M1 and the rest of the M has some kind of uh, uh, metastasis detected in one way or the other. So how do we treat these uh, patients? Definitely, whenever we can, we should do uh, surgery with gross total resection. Based on studies, unfortunately, only 55% of the cases can be resected safely. Um, if the lesion cannot be uh, resected uh, safely, you know, we need to measure how much is the remaining uh, uh, tissue left behind. But definitely gross total resection and a good amount of resection with small amount of residual tumor uh, harbors good uh, prognosis, better survival. So once we've done the surgery, we need to do an MRI within four, 48 hours to assess the success of the surgery and then stratify the patient either to standard or high risk based on evidence of uh, metastasis, based on tumor volume, and based on histology. Also, some molecular markers like MIG uh, amplification can uh, harbor some uh, significance and can uh, play a role in our decision making. Radiation treatment is basically the backbone of treatment. Every patient should go uh, uh, when treatment is further treatment is needed, should uh, get uh, radiation treatment. The amount of radiation treatment is still under review. And uh, in adults, we are trying to figure out whether the lower dose radiation treatment will be just as beneficial, but maybe harbor less side effects. So again, the risk stratification will help us decide which group the patient will go into. Uh, when we think about radiation treatment, proton uh, uh, beam therapy is recommended just to save the patient from common side effects that would come from traditional uh, radiation treatment. And most patients need to get adjuvant chemotherapy. For adults, we use most frequently the modified PECO regimen, and we needed to modify the original PECO regimen because adults don't tolerate uh, as much chemotherapy. They usually have more cytotoxicity, they don't tolerate the treatment, they have more neuropathy, and this is the most frequently used treatment. Definitely, it is not recommended to give vincristine during radiation treatment for uh, adults because of the concern of neuropathy, uh, but it is uh, used in the adjuvant setting. There is another regimen called Taylor regimen, which use uh, vincristine, etoposide, carboplastin, and cyclophosphamide. And many regions, and it's commonly used in Europe, they use cisplatin or a platinum-based uh, drug, cisplatin or carboplatin, with etoposide. This is actually the drug that we used uh, at Hopkins, where I did my fellowship, and uh, we put together a kind of like a a series of patients, of 13 uh, patients who received the cisplatin etoposide treatment. Uh, the patients were about uh, 22 to 47 year old. They received an average of four cycles of treatment. And we followed um, why 
the head hematological toxicity on this treatment, they were tolerated the treatment well. And definitely because vincristine was, wasn't given, we saved them for the uh, bothersome neurotoxicity. So this is another regimen that can be considered for uh, these patients. Following the uh, surgery and during treatment, patient needs to be followed with serious uh, MRI imaging that is well-defined in NCCN guidelines. In addition to that, these patients require a lot of additional help. Definitely, these patients need to be sent for fertility conservation, uh, consultation and um, evaluation. Many of them will need cognitive rehabilitation that needs to be started early on. The patients need to be connected with an endocrinologist for uh, upcoming uh, endocrine issues. They need to be sent uh, for hearing evaluation, ophthalmology. They need to follow up with neuro-oncology for long-term for disease recurrence watch and for secondary malignancy watch. If the patient got vincristine, you know, the patient might need uh, neurology and some help with the neuropathic pain. And they need a lot of uh, psychosocial and uh, additional help that probably a survivorship clinic can help with. Where are we going as future treatment? I think today we heard a lot about um, that we need to be more specific. The science is going that we need to evaluate uh, uh, the groups. We need to do more molecular analysis and we need to distinguish patients better from each other based on molecular uh, data. And once we do that, we will be better uh, in a better position to provide targeted treatment that will be actually effective. There are some exciting drugs that are in investigation right now, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about these clinical studies. And these are my, recommend, uh, my references, and thank you very much for, for your time.